The normal distribution is arguably the most important concept in statistics. Everything we do, or almost everything we do in inferential statistics, which is essentially making inferences based on uh, data points, is to some degree based on the normal distribution. And so what I want to do in this video and in this, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, spreadsheet is to essentially give you as deep an understanding of the normal distribution as possible and you know just in the rest of your life you're always if someone says oh we're assuming a normal distribution you're like oh I know what that is this is the formula and I understand how to use it etc cetera, etc cetera. so this spreadsheet just so you know is downloadable at www.khanacademy.org slash downloads slash and if you just type that part in you'll see everything that's downloadable but then download slash normal intro dot xls and then you'll get this spreadsheet right here and I think it's I did this in the right standard but anyway if you go onto Wikipedia and if you were to type in normal distribution or you do, were to do a search for normal distribution let me actually get my pen tool going this is what you would see. I literally copied and pasted this right here from Wikipedia and I know it looks daunting you know you have all these Greek letters there but this is just the sigma right here, that is just the standard deviation of the distribution. We'll play with that a little bit with in this in this chart and see what that means. And well, I mean, you know what the standard deviation is in general, but this is the standard deviation of this distribution, which is a probability density function. And I encourage you to rewatch the video on probability density functions because it's a little bit of a transition going from the binomial distribution, which is discrete. Right? And the binomial distribution say, oh, what is the probability of getting a 5? And you just kind of look at that histogram or that bar chart and you say, oh, that's the probability. But in a continuous probability distribution or a, a continuous probability density function, you can't just say, what is the probability of me getting a 5? You have to say, what is the probability of me getting between, let's say, a 4.5 and a 5.5? You have to give it some range. And then your probability isn't given by just reading this graph. The probability is given by the area under that curve, right? It would be given by this area. And for those of y'all who know calculus, if p of x is our probability density function, it doesn't have to be a normal distribution, although it almost always, well, it often is a normal distribution. The way you actually figure out the probability of, you know, let's say between four and a half and five and a half. What is the probability? You know, this is whatever the the odds of me getting between four and a half and five and a half inches of rain tomorrow. It'll actually be the integral from four and a half to five and a half of this probability density function, or of this probability density function, dx. Right? So that's just the area in the curve. For those of you who don't know calculus yet, I encourage you to watch that playlist. But all this is is saying the area in the curve from here to here. And it actually turns out for the normal distribution, this isn't an easy thing to evaluate analytically. And so you do it numerically, and that kind of, you know, you, you don't have to feel bad about doing it numerically because you're like, oh, how do I take the uh, integral of this? There, there's actually functions for it, and you can even approximate. I mean, one way you could approximate it is you could use it the way you approximate integrals in general, where you could say, well, what is the area of this? What's well, roughly, you know, the area of this trapezoid? So you could figure out the area of that trapezoid, taking the average of that point and that point, and multiplying it by the base. Or you could just take the fun level, the let me change colors just because I think I'm overdoing it with the green. Or you could just take the height of this line right here and multiply it by the base, and you'll get the area of this rectangle, which might be a pretty good approximation for the area under the curve, right? Because you'll have a little bit extra over here, but you're going to miss a little bit over there. So it might be a pretty good approximation. And that's actually what I do in the other video, just to approximate the area under the curve and give you a good sense that the normal distribution is what the binomial distribution becomes, essentially, if you have a, a many, 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 many trials. And what's interesting about the normal distribution, just so you know, I don't know if I mentioned this already, this right here, this is the graph. And uh, and, and this is you know just another word. You know, people might talk about the central limit theorem, but this is really kind of one of the most important or interesting things about our universe, central limit theorem. I won't prove it here, but it essentially tells us, and you could kind of understand it by looking at the other video where we talk about flipping coins, and if we were to do many, many, many flips of coins, right? those are independent trials of each other. And if you take the sum of all of your flips, if you were to give yourself one point if you got ahead every time, and if you were to take the sum of them, as you approach an infinite number of flips, you approach the normal distribution. And what's interesting about that is each of those trials, in the case of flipping a coin, each trial is a flip of the coin, 
each of those trials don't have to have a normal distribution. So we could be talking about molecular interactions. And you know, every time compound X interacts with compound Y, you know, what might result doesn't have to have be normally distributed. But what happens is if you take a sum of a ton of those interactions, then all of a sudden the, the end result will be normally distributed. And this is why this is such an important distribution. It shows up in nature all of the time. And if people are uh, trying to kind of, if you do take data points from something that is very, very complex and, and that it is the sum of arguably many, many, almost infinite uh, individual independent trials, it's a pretty good assumption to assume the normal distribution. We'll, talk, we'll do other videos where we talk about when it is a good assumption and when it isn't a good assumption. But anyway, just to digest this a little bit, and let me, let me actually rewrite it. This is what you'll see on Wikipedia, but this could be rewritten as 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi times x is just e to that power. So it's just e to the this whole thing over here minus x minus the mean squared over 2 sigma squared. This is a standard deviation. Standard deviation squared is just the variance, right? And just so you know how to use this, you're like, oh wow, there's so many Greek letters here. What do I do? This tells you the height of the normal distribution function. That, you know, let's say that this is the distribution of, um, I don't know, of 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 people's, um, I don't know, how 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 far north they live from my house or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm well, no, that's not a good one. Let's say it's it's people's heights above five nine. Let's say that this was five nine and not zero. Right. What this tells you is, if you were to say how you know what prob what percentage of people, or I guess what is the probability, if you wanted to figure out what is the probability of some finding someone who is roughly five inches taller than the average right here, what you would do is you would put in this number here, you know, this five into x, and then you know the standard deviation because you've taken a bunch of samples, you know the variance which is the standard deviation squared, you know the mean. And you just put your x in there, and it'll tell you the height of the function. And then you have to give it a range. You have to. You can't just say how many people are exactly five inches taller than average. You would actually say how many people are between 5.1 inches and 4.9 inches taller than the average. You have to give it a little bit of range because no one is exactly, or you know, it's almost infinitely impossible to the atom to be exactly five foot nine. Even the definition of an inch isn't defined that particularly. So that's how you use this function. I think it's. You know, this is so heavily used in you know one it shows up in nature, but in all of inferential st statistics, I think it it behooves you to become as familiar with this formula as possible. And I guess to make that happen, let me play around a little bit with this formula just to kind of give you an intuition of how everything works out, et cetera, et cetera. So if I were to take this, and I, you know, I I like to just it'll maybe help you memorize it. This could be rewritten as if we take the sigma into the square root sign, if we take the standard deviation in there. It becomes 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma squared. I've never seen it written this way, but it gives me a little intuition that sigma squared, it's always written as you know sigma squared, but it's really just the variance. And the variance is what you calculate before you calculate the standard deviation. So that's interesting. And then this top right here, this could be written as e to the minus 1 half times, and if we were to just take this, if we were to, you know, both of these things here are squared, so we could just say, x minus the mean over sigma squared. And this kind of clarifies a little bit what's going on here a little bit better. Because what's this? x minus sigma is the distance between whatever point we want to find. Let's say we're here. x minus, x minus mu. x minus mu, mu is the mean. So that's here. So that's this distance. And then this is the standard deviation, which is this distance. So this right, this in here tells me how many standard deviations I am away from the mean, and that's actually called the standard z-score. I talk about it in the other video, and then we square that, and then we take this to the minus one half. Well, let me rewrite that. If I were to write e to the minus one half times a, that's the same thing as e to the a to the minus one half power, right? If you take something to an exponent and then take that to an exponent, you can just multiply these exponents. So likewise. This could be rewritten as this is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi 
sigma squared, which is just the variance. And I'm just playing around with the formula because I really want you to see all the ways that it, you know, maybe you'll get a little intuition. And I encourage you to email me if you see some insight on, you know, why this exists and all of that. But once again, I think it is cool that all of a sudden we have this other formula that has pi and e in it, and this is really just, you know, this is what the central, you know, so many phenomenon, this is uh, are described by this. And once again, pi and e show up together, right? Just like e to the i pi is equal to negative one tells you something about 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 our universe. But anyway, I could rewrite this as e to the x minus mu over sigma squared, and all of that to the minus 1 half. Something in the minus 1 half power, that's just 1 over the square root, which is already going on here. So we could just rewrite this over here as 1 over the square root of 2 pi times the variance times e to essentially our z score squared, right? If we say z is this thing in here, z is how many standard deviations we are from the mean, z score squared. And all of a sudden, this kind of becomes a very clean, you know, we just say 2 pi times our variance times e to the number of standard deviations we are away from the mean. You square that. You take the square root of that thing and invert it, and that's also to, that's that's the normal distribution. So anyway, I wanted to do that just because I thought it was neat, and it's it's interesting to play around with it. And that way, if you see it in any of these other forms in the rest of your life, you won't say, "What's that?" I thought the normal distribution was this or was this, and now you know. With that said, let's play around a little bit with this normal distribution. So in this spreadsheet. I've plotted normal distribution. You can change the assumptions that are in this kind of uh, a green blue color. So right now it's plotting it with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 4. And I just write the variance here just for your information. The variance is just the standard deviation squared. And so what happens when you change the mean? So if the mean goes from 0 to, let's say, it goes to 5, notice this graph just shifted to the right by 5, right? It was centered here. Now it's centered over here. If we make it minus 5, what happens? The whole bell curve just shifts 5 to the left from the center. Now what happens when you change the standard deviation? Right, The standard deviation is a measure of, it, the, you know, the variance is the average squared distance from the mean. The standard deviation is the square root of that. So it's kind of, not exactly, but kind of the average distance from the mean. So the smaller the standard deviation, the closer a lot of the points are going to be to the mean. So we should get kind of a, a narrower graph. And let's see if that, that happens. So when the standard deviation is 2, we see that. The graph, you're more likely to be really close to the mean than further away. And if you make the standard deviation, I don't know, if you make it 10, all of a sudden you get a really flat graph. And this thing keeps going on forever. And that's another, that's a key difference. The binomial distribution is always finite. You can only have a finite number of values. While the normal distribution is defined over the entire real number line. So uh, you know, the probability if you have an ex if you have a mean of minus five and a and a standard deviation of ten, the probability of having like, you know, getting a thousand here is very very low but there is some some probability it's like the you know there's some probability that i fall that all of the atoms in my body just arrange perfectly that i fall through the seat i'm sitting on it's very unlikely and it probably won't happen in the life of the universe but it can happen and you know and that could be described by a normal distribution because it says you know anything can happen although it could be very 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 unprobable so you know the the, the thing i talked about at the beginning of the video is when you figure out a normal distribution you have to you can't just look at this point on the graph. Let me get the drop pen tool back. You have to figure out the area of the cur under the curve between two points. Right? So if I wanted to say, let's say this was our distribution, and I said, what is the probability that I get 0? I don't know what phenomenon this is describing, but that 0 happened. If I say exactly 0, the probability is 0. Because <laughs> I shouldn't use 0 too much. because the area under the curve, just under zero, it's not a. There's no area. It's just a line. You have to say between a range. So you have to say the probability between, um, you know, let's say minus, and actually I can type it in here on our, on our. I can say the probability between, let's say minus 0 0.005, and plus 0 0.05, is well, it rounded, so it says they're close to zero. Let me do it between minus one and between 1. right? It calculated at 7%, and I'll show you how I calculated this in a second. 
So let me get the screen draw tool. So what did I just do? This between minus one and one, and I'll show you the behind the scenes what Excel is doing. We're going from minus one, which is roughly right here, to one, and we're calculating the area under the curve. Right? We're calculating this area. Or for those of you who know calculus, we're calculating the integral from minus one to one of this function where the standard deviation is right here, is 10, and the mean is minus five. And actually, let me put that in. So we're calculating, for this example, the way it's drawn right here, the normal distribution function, let's see, our standard deviation is 10 times the square root of two pi times e to the minus 1 half times x minus our mean. Our mean is negative right now. right? Our mean is minus 5, so it's x plus 5 over the standard deviation squared, which is the variance. So that's 100 squared dx. This is what this number is right here, this 7% or actually 0.07 is the area right under there. Now, unfortunately for us in the world, this isn't an easy integral to evaluate analytically, even for those of us who know our calculus. So this tends to be done numerically. And, a, and kind of an easy way to do this, and uh, well, not an easy way, but uh, a, a function has been defined called the cumulative distribution function that is a, a useful tool for figuring out this area. So what the cumulative distribution function is, is essentially, let me call it the cumulative distribution function. It tells uh, you know it's a function of x. It gives us the area under the curve under this curve. So let's say that this is x right here. That's our x. It tells you the area under the curve up to x. Or so another way to think about it, it tells you what is the probability that you land at some value less than your x value. So it's the it's the area from minus infinity to x of our probability density function. dx. And there's actually a, a an Excel when you actually use the Excel uh, normal distribution function. The you know the you say norm distribution. You have to give it your x value. You give it the mean. You give it the standard deviation, and then you say whether you want the you want you want the cumulative distribution, in which case you say true, or you want just this normal little distribution, which you say false. So to, if you wanted to graph this right here, you would say false in caps. If you wanted to graph the cumulative distribution function, which I do down here, let me move this down a little bit. Uh, let me get out of the pen tool. So the cumulative distribution function is right over here. Then you say true when you make that Excel call. So this is a cumulative distribution function for the same, for this. This is a normal distribution. Here's a cumulative distribution. And just so you get the intuition, is if you want to know what is the probability that I get a value less than 20, right? So I can get any value less than 20 given this distribution. The cumulative distribution right here, let me get, make it so you can see the, if you go to 20, you just go right to that point there and you say, wow, the, the probability of getting 20 or less, it's pretty high. It's, you know, it's approaching 100%. That makes sense because most of the area under this curve is less than 20. Or if you said, what's the probability of getting less than five, less than minus five. Well, minus five was the mean. So half of your results should be above that, and half should be below. And if you go to this point right here, you can see that this right here is 50%. So the probability of getting less than minus five is exactly 50%. So what you do is, if I wanted to know, if I wanted to know the probability of going getting between negative one and one, what I do is, let me get back to my pen tool. What I do is I figure out what is the probability of getting minus 1 or lower, right? So I figure out this whole area. And then I figure out the probability of getting 1 or lower, which is this whole area. Well, let me do it in a different color. 1 or lower is everything there. And I subtract the yellow area from the magenta area, and I'll just get what's ever left over here, right? So what I do is I take, and that's exactly what I did in the spreadsheet. Let me scroll down. This might be taxing my computer by taking the screen capture with it. So what I did is I evaluated the cumulative distribution function at 1, which would be right there. And I evaluate the cumulative distribution function at minus 1, 
which is right there. And the difference between these two, I subtract this number from this number, and that tells me essentially the probability that I'm between those two numbers. Or another way to think about it, the area, the area right here. And I really encourage you to play with this and explore the Excel formulas and everything. This area right, right here between minus 1 and 1. Now one thing that shows up a lot is, you know, what's the probability that you land within a standard deviation of, and just so you know this graph, the central line right here, this is the mean. And then these two lines I drew right here, these are one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above the mean. And some people think, you know, what's the probability that I land within one standard deviation of the mean? Well, that's easy to do. What I can do is I, I'll just click on this, and I could call this, what's the probability that I land between Let's see, one standard deviation, mi the mean is minus 5. One standard deviation below the mean is minus 15. And one standard deviation above the mean is 10 plus minus 5 is 5. So that's between 5 and 15. So 68.3%, and that's actually always the case, that you have a 68.3% probability of, of landing within one standard deviation of the mean, assuming you have a normal distribution. So once again, that number comes from that represents the area under the curve here, this area under the curve. And the way you, you get it is with the cumulative distribution function. Let me go down here. Every time I move this, I have to get rid of the pen tool. So you go from, you evaluate it at plus 5, which is right here. Right, this was one standard deviation above the mean, which yeah, it's a number right around there. Looks like it's like, yeah, I don't know. 80 something percent, maybe 90 percent, roughly. And then you evaluate it at one standard deviation below the mean, which is minus 15. And this one looks like, I don't know, roughly 15 percent or so, 15, 16, maybe 17 percent, let's say 18 percent. But the, the big picture is when you subtract this value from this value, you get the probability that you land between those two. And that's because this value tells the probability that you're less than. So when you go to the cumulative distribution function, you get that right there. That tells the probability that you are, let me get, uh, I keep scrolling back and forth. Let me. That tells you that you're the, so when you look, when you go to 5, and you go right over here, this essentially tells you this area under the curve, the probability that you're less than or equal to 5, everything up there. And then when you evaluate it at minus 15 down here, it tells you the probability that you're at down back here. So when you subtract this from the larger thing, you're just left with what's under the curve right there. And just to understand this, this spreadsheet a little bit better, just because I really want you to play with it and move the, you know, see what happens when, you know, if I make this distribution, it was my, the mean was minus 5, now let me make it 5. It just shifted to the right. It just moved over to the right by 5, right? Oh, whoops. I'll use the pen tool. It just moved over to the right by 5. If I were to, if, and if I were to try to make the standard deviation smaller, we'll see that the whole thing just gets a little bit tighter. Let's make it 6. And all of a sudden, this looks a little bit tighter curve. We make it 2, it becomes even tighter. And just so you know how I calculated everything, and I really want you to play with this and play with the, the formula and get an intuitive feeling for this, the cumulative distribution function, and think a lot about how it relates to the binomial distribution. And I covered that in the last video. This, I just, to plot this, I just took each of these points. I went to plot the points between minus 20 and 20. And I just incremented by 1, right? I just decided to increment by 1. So this isn't, it's not a continuous curve. It's actually just taking, plotting a point at each point and connecting it with a line. Then I did the distance between each of those points and the mean, right? So I just took, let's say that, you know, this, the 0 minus 5, this is this distance. So this just tells you the point. Minus 20 is 25 less than the mean, right? That's all I did there. Then I divided that by the standard deviation. And this is, this is the z-score, the standard z-score. right? So this tells me how many points, how many standard deviations is minus 20 away from the mean. It's 12 and a half standard deviations below the mean. And then I used that, and I just plugged it into essentially this formula to figure out the height of the function. So let's say at minus 20, the height is very low. At minus 5, well, let's say at minus, at minus 2, the height's a little bit better. The height's going to be someplace, it's going to be like, you know, right there. And then 
And so that gives me that value. But then to actually figure out the probability of that, what I do is I calculate the, the cumulative distribution function between, well, this is the, the value that the probability that you're less than that. So you know the, the area under the curve below that, which is very, very small. It's not zero. I know it looks like zero here, but that's only because I round it. It's going to be you know zero, 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 one. It's going to be a really, really small number. There's some probability that we even get like a minus a thousand. And another in intuitive thing that you really should have a sense for is, you know, what is the prob the the integral over this or the entire area of the curve has to be one because that takes into account all possible circumstances. And that should happen if we put a suitably small number here and a suitably large number here. There you go. We get 100%. Although this isn't 100%. We would have to go from minus infinity to plus infinity to really get 100%. It's just rounding to 100%. It's probably you know 99.999999% or something like that. And so, you know, just and so to actually calculate this, what I do is I take the cumulative distribution function of this point and I subtract from that the cumulative distribution function of that point. And that's where I got this 100% from. Anyway, hopefully that'll give you uh, a good feel for the, for, the, uh, for the normal distribution. And you know, I really encourage you to play with the spreadsheet and to even make a spreadsheet like this yourself. And in future exercises, we'll actually use this uh, type of a spreadsheet to, as an input into other models. So if, you know, if we're doing a financial model, and if we say our revenue has a normal distribution around some expected value, what is the distribution of our net income? Or, or we could think of a uh, hundred other different types of examples. Anyway, see you in the next video.